Chapter 12 Thy love and hate are both unwise ones, lady. Well, Theodore, what is your discovery? asked Lord Cheriton half an hour later, the two men standing face to face in Mrs. Porter's sitting-room, amidst the silence of the summer morning, a gigantic bee buzzing in the brown velvet heart of a tall sunflower, painfully audible to the younger man's strained ears. There is a letter, sir. You had better read that before I say anything, answered Theodore. It was years since he had called his cousin sir, not since he had been a schoolboy, and had been encouraged to open his mind upon politics or cricket over his single glass of claret after dinner. On those occasions a boyish respect for greatness had prompted the ceremonious address. Today it came to his lips involuntarily, as if a barrier of ice were suddenly interposed between himself and the man he had esteemed and admired for so many years of his life. Lord Cheriton held the letter in his hand, unopened, while he stood looking at the pistol case, where both pistols occupied their places, one bright and undamaged, the other rusted and spoiled, as to outward appearance at least. He was ghastly pale, but not much more so than he had looked yesterday after he left Mrs. Porter's cottage. "'That is my discovery,' said Theodore, pointing to the pistols. "'I stopped short in my journey to Scotland Yard when I found that case upon the table here.' I want to secure Juanita and her son from the possibilities of an insatiable hatred, but I don't want to bring trouble, or disgrace, upon you if I can help it. You have always been good to me, Lord Cheriton. You have regarded the claims of kindred. It would be base in me if I were to forget that you are of my own blood, that you have a right to my allegiance. Tell me, for God's sake, what am I to do? Trust me if you can." I know so much already that it will be wisest and best for you to let me know all, so that I may help you find the murderer and to avoid any reopening of old wounds. I doubt if you or anyone else can help me, Theodore, said Lord Cheriton wearily, looking straight before him through the open lattice and across the little flower garden where the roses were still in their plenitude of color and perfume. I doubt if all my worldly experience will enable me to help myself even. There is a pass to which a man may come in his life, not wholly by his own fault, at which his case seems hopeless. He sees himself suddenly brought to a dead stop, deep in the mire of an impassable road, and with the words, no thoroughfare, staring him in the face. I have come to just that point. Oh, but there is always an issue from every difficulty for a man of courage and resolution, said Theodore. I know you are not a man to be easily broken down by fate. I am half in the light and half in the dark. It must have been the owner of that pistol who killed Godfrey Carmichael. But how came the case and the fellow pistol into Mrs. Porter's possession? Was she that man's accomplice? And who was he, and what was he, that she should be associated with him? You believe that it was a man who fired that pistol? Most assuredly. I believe it was the man whose wife lived for many years at Myrtle Cottage, Camberwell Grove. The man who called upon a house agent at Camberwell to make inquiries about his wife and who called himself by the name she bore in the neighborhood, the name of Danvers. Danvers may have been only an alias for Darcy, and in that case the man who called upon the agent was the husband of Evelyn Strangway, and the woman who lived for so many years in the seclusion of Myrtle Cottage was old Squire Strangway's only daughter, and Captain Darcy's runaway wife. "'And you think Tom Darcy murdered my son-in-law?' asked Lord Cheriton with a ghastly smile. "'I do.' And what do you suppose to have been the motive of that murder? Revenge. Revenge upon the man who tempted his wife away from him. The cur who ill-used and neglected his wife, whose conduct drove her from her wretched home and justified her abandonment of him, was never man enough to conceive such a revenge, or to hate with such a hatred. However, in this case we need not enter upon the question of motive. There is one reason why Tom Darcy cannot be suspected of any part in Sir Godfrey's murder. He died nine years ago, and was buried at my expense in Norwood Cemetery. Great God! Then who could have fired that pistol? The answer to that question is most likely here, replied Lord Cheriton quietly as he tore open the envelope of Mrs. Porter's letter. The letter was brief, but comprehensive, and all-sufficing. You know now who killed your cherished daughter's husband. If she is like me, she will carry her sorrow to the grave. If she is like me, all her days will be darkened by cruel memories. Your broken promise blighted my life. I have blighted her life. An eye for an eye. 
I told you three and twenty years ago that a day would come when you would be sorry for having abandoned me. I think that day has come. Evelyn Darcy Lord Cheriton handed the letter to his kinsman without a word. Since you know so much of my history, you may as well know all, he said. So know the thorny pillow which a man makes for himself when he sacrifices the best years of his life to an illicit love. Theodore read those ghastly lines in silence. The signature told all. What in heaven's name brought Evelyn Strangway to be a lodgekeeper at the entrance of the house where she was born? He asked at last. How could you permit such a lifelong humiliation? It was her own desire. It was at her insistence I allowed her to come here. I opposed her fancy with all my power of argument, with all the strength of opposition. I offered to provide her with a home in town or country, at home or abroad, near at hand or at the Antipodes. I offered to settle four hundred a year upon her, to sink capital to that amount, to make her future and that of our child secure against the chances of fate. Your child, Mercy, exclaimed Theodore. Yes, Mercy, my daughter and hers. You understand now why she refused my help. She would take nothing from her father. There was a like perversity in mother and daughter, a determination to make me drink the cup of remorse to the dregs. Oh, Theodore, it is a long and shameful story. To you, for the first time in my life, to you only among mankind these lips have spoken of it. I have kept my secret. I have brooded upon it in the slow hours of many and many a wakeful night. I have never forgotten. I have not been allowed to forget. If time could have erased or softened that bitter memory under other conditions, I know not. But for me the case was hopeless. My victim was there, at my gates, a perpetual memento of my folly and my wrongdoing. Strange that a woman of refinement and education should elect to fill so degrading a position. Perhaps only a refined and highly educated woman could have devised so refined a punishment. Let me live near you, she pleaded. Let me live at the gate of the park I loved so well when I was a child. Let me see you pass sometimes. Open the gate for you and just see you go by, without a word, without a look even upon your part. It will be some consolation for me in my lonely, loveless life. I shall know that at least I am not forgotten. Forgotten? As if it had been possible for me to forget, in the happiest circumstances, even if she had made for herself a home at the farthest extremity of Europe, or in the remotest of our colonies. As it was, her presence embittered the place I loved, the great reward and aim of my life. Her shadow fell across my young wife's pathway. Her influence darkened all my days. He began to pace up and down the little room with a feverish air. He seemed to find a sort of relief in talking of this burden which he had borne so long in secret, born with a smile upon his lips, suffering that silent agony which strong men have borne again and again in the history of mankind, carrying their silent punishment upon them till the grave revealed the hidden canker, and lay bare the festering wound which had rankled unsuspected by the world. She was cruelly treated by her husband, Theodore, a young and beautiful woman married to a profligate and a sot. It had been a love match, as the world calls it, that is to say, a marriage brought about by a schoolgirl's impatience to break her bonds and a woman's first delight in hearing herself called beautiful. She had flung herself away upon a handsome reprobate, and three or four years after marriage she found herself alone and neglected in a shabby lodging in one of the squalidest streets of the Strand. I can see the wretched room she lived in today as I stand here, the lodging house furniture, the dingy curtains darkening the dirty windows looking into the dirty street. What a home for youth and beauty. He paused with an impatient sigh, took another turn across the narrow space, and then resumed. Our acquaintance began by accident, under an umbrella. I met them together one night, husband and wife, leaving the little Strand Theatre in the rain. I heard him tell her that it was not worth while to take a cab, they were so near home, and something in her proud, handsome face and her contemptuous way of replying to him caught my attention and interested me in her. I offered my umbrella, and we all three walked to Essex Street together. Just in that fortuitous way began the alliance which was to give its color to all my life. The husband cultivated my acquaintance, was glad to meet me at my club, 
and dined with me as often as I cared to ask him. We used to go to Essex Street after dining together and finish the evening with her, and so by degrees I came to know all about her, that she was the only daughter of the owner of Cheriton Chase, that she was very handsome and very clever, though only half educated, that she had offended her father by her marriage, and that she had not brought her husband a penny, that he neglected her, and that he drank, and that she was miserable. I came to know this very soon. I came very soon to love her. She was the first woman I had ever cared for, and I loved her passionately. He took another turn and sighed again, regretfully, despairingly, as one who looks back upon the pallid ghost of a love that has long been dead. It began with pity. I was so sorry for her, poor soul, her wasted life, her slighted beauty. God knows that for a long time I had no thought of sin. Gradually the yearning to see more of her, to bring some brightness and pleasure into her life, became too strong for prudence, and I persuaded her to meet me unknown to her husband. We planned little excursions, innocent enough in themselves, a morning drive and a modest luncheon at Richmond or Greenwich, or Jack Straw's Castle, a trip to Hampton Court or Windsor by boat or rail. She had hardly any acquaintances in London, and there was little fear of her being recognized. We went to a theatre together now and then, and sat in a dark stage box, happy, talking of an impossible future in the intervals of the performance. We never said as much, but I think we both had a vague idea that Providence would help us, that her husband would die young and leave us free to be happy together. Yes, we were very fond of each other, very single-hearted in those days. She was only two and twenty, remember, and I was still a young man. Another pause, another sigh and a look across the roses, as if across the long lapse of years to an unforgotten past. Heaven knows how long we might have gone on this way without sin, if not without treachery to the husband, who cared so little for his wife that it seemed scarcely dishonorable to deceive him. Our fate was precipitated by circumstances. Darcy surprised a little note of mine, asking Evelyn to meet me at a theater. He attacked his wife brutally, refused to believe anything except the worst. He called her by names that were new and hideous to her ear, and her soul rose up in arms against him. She defied him, ran out of the house, took a cab, and came to my chambers in the foggy November evening. She came to me helpless, friendless, with no one in this wide world to love her or to protect her except me. This was the turning point. Of course, she could not stay there to be seen by my clerk and my laundress. I took her to Salisbury that night, and we spent a fortnight moving from village to village along the south coast of Devonshire. My hope was that Darcy would apply for a divorce, and that in less than a year I might make the woman I loved my wife. I rejoiced in the thought of his obscurity and hers. The record of the case would pass unnoticed in the papers, and years hence, when I should have made a position at the bar, nobody need know that the wife I loved and honored was once the runaway wife of another man. I had argued without allowing for the malignity of a cur. Darcy wrote his wife one of the most diabolical letters that ever was penned by man. He wreaked his venom upon her, upon her, the weaker sinner. He called her by all the vile epithets in his copious vocabulary, and he told her that she should never have the right to the name of an honest woman, for that he would sooner hang himself than divorce her. And so she was to drag her chain for the rest of his days. And so she was to pay the bitter price of having trusted her young life to a low-bred scoundrel. Hard luck for both of you, said Theodore. Yes, it was indeed hard luck. If you could know how truly and entirely I loved her in those days, how completely happy we should have been in each other's society, but for the embittering consciousness of our false position. Cut off by his malevolence from escape by divorce, we naturally hoped for a day when we should be released by his death. His habits were not those which conduced to length of years. We talked of the future. We had our plans and dreams about that life which was to be ours in after days, when I should be making a large income, and when she would be really my wife. With that hope before her, she was content to live in the strictest seclusion, to economize in every detail of our existence, to know no pleasure except that of my society. Never did a handsome woman resign herself to a duller or more unselfish existence. And yet, I believe, for the first few years she was happy. We were both happy, and we were full of hope. 
I remember the day she first suggested to me that I should buy Cheriton Chase when it came into the market. I was beginning to be employed in important cases, and to get big fees marked upon my briefs, and I had taken silk. I had made my name, and I was saving money. Yet the suggestion that I should buy a large estate was too wild for any one but a woman to have made. From that hour, however, it was Evelyn's idée fixe. She had a passionate love for her birthplace, an overweening pride in her race and name. She urged me to accumulate money. The estate would be sacrificed at half its value, perhaps, would go for an old song. She became rigidly economical, would hardly allow herself a new gown, and her keenest delight was in the deposit notes I brought her as my money accumulated at the Union Bank. She had no idea of investments or interest for my accumulations. Her notions about money were a child's notions, the idea of saving a large sum to buy the desire of her heart, and the desire of her heart was charity and chase. God knows I was honest and earnest enough in those days. I meant to buy that estate for her sake if it was possible to be done. I meant to marry her directly she was free to become my wife. My fidelity had not wavered after a union of ten years and more, but Darcy was very far from dying. He had hunted out his wife in her quiet retreat, had threatened and annoyed her, and I had been obliged to buy him off by paying his passage to Canada, where he had been quartered with his regiment years before, and which he pretended would open a new field for him. Our case, so far as he was concerned, seemed hopeless, and I was beginning to feel the darkness of the outlook when I made Maria Morales' acquaintance. It was the old, old story, Theodore. God forbid you should ever go through that hackneyed experience. Just as the old chain was beginning to drag heavily, a new face appeared upon my pathway, a girlish face, bright with promise and hope. I saw the opportunity of a union which would smooth my way to a great position, crown the edifice of my fortune, give me a wife of whom I might be proud. Could I ever have been proud of the woman who had sacrificed her good name for my sake? I was bound to her by every consideration of honor and duty. But there was the fatal stain across both our lives. I could not take her into society without the fear of hearing malignant whispers as we passed. However well these social secrets may be kept, there is always some enemy to hunt them out, and the antecedents of James Dalbrook's wife would have been public property. And here was a beautiful and innocent girl who loved me well enough to accept me as her husband, although I was twenty years her senior, loved me with that youthful upward-looking love which is of all sentiments the most attractive to a man who has lived a hard work -a life in a hard work -a world. To spend an hour with Maria was to feel a Sabbath peacefulness which solaced and refreshed my soul. I felt ten years younger when I was with her than I felt in my own home. He stopped with a heartbroken sigh. Oh, Theodore, beware of such burdens as that which I laid upon my shoulders. Beware of such a chain as I wound about my steps. What a dastard a man feels himself when his love begins to cool for the woman who cast her life upon one chance, who leans upon him as the beginning and end of her existence. I have walked up and down the quiet pathway before Myrtle Cottage for an hour at a stretch, dreading to go in, lest she should read my treason on my face. The break came at last, suddenly. I paltered with my fate for a long time. I carried on a kind of platonic flirtation with Maria Morales, taking monstrous pains to let her know that I never meant to go beyond platonics, reminding her of the difference of our ages and of my almost paternal regard, the vain subterfuge of a self-deluded man. One moment of impulse swept away all barriers, and I left Onslow Square Maria's engaged husband. Her father's generosity precipitated matters. Squire Strangway had been dead nearly a year, and the estate was in the hands of the mortgagee, who had been trying to sell it for some time. My future father-in-law was eager for the purchase directly I suggested it to him, and my wife's dowry afforded me the means of realizing Evelyn's long, cherished dream. Cruel for her, poor creature! Cruel, brutal, diabolical. I felt the blackness of my treason, and yet it had been brought about by circumstances rather than by any deliberate act of mine. I had to go to the woman who still loved me and still trusted me and tell her what I was going to do. I had to do this, and I did it, by word of mouth, face to face, not resorting to the coward's expedient of pen and ink. God help me, the memory of that scene is with me now. 
It was too terrible for words, but after the storm came a calm, and a week later I went across to Boulogne with her and saw her comfortably established there at a private hotel, where she was to remain as long as she liked, while she made up her mind as to her future residence. The furniture was sent to the Pantechnicon. The home was broken up forever. And the daughter, where was she? Lord Cheriton answered with a smile of infinite bitterness. The daughter had troubled us very little. Evelyn was not an exacting mother. The child's existence was a burden to her, rendered hateful by the stigma upon her birth which the mother could not forget. Mercy's infancy was spent in a Buckinghamshire village in the cottage of her foster mother. Mother and daughter never lived under the same roof till they came here together when Mercy was seven years old. Yet, according to the village tradition, Mrs. Porter was passionately fond of her daughter and broken-hearted at her loss. Village tradition often lies. I do not believe that Evelyn ever loved her child. She bitterly felt the circumstances of her birth. She bitterly resented her unhappy fate. But I believe it was her pride, her deep sense of wrong done to herself, which tortured her rather than her love for her child. She is a strange woman, Theodore. A woman who could do that deed a woman who could write that letter. Your friend has fathomed her unhappy secret. She was a mad woman when she fired that shot. She was mad when she penned that letter. And now, Theodore, I have trusted you as I have never before trusted mortal man. I have ripped open an old wound. You know all, and you see what lies before me. I have to find that woman and to save her from the consequences of her crime, and to save my daughter and my grandson from the hazards of a mad woman's malignity. You can help me, Theodore, if you can keep a cool, clear brain, and do just what I ask you to do, and no more. He put aside his emotion with one stupendous effort, and became a man of iron, cool, resolute, unflinching. I will obey you implicitly, said Theodore. He had been completely won by his kinsman's candor. Had James Dalbrook told him anything less than the truth, he would have despised him. As it was, he felt that he could still respect him, in spite of that fatal error which had brought such deadly retribution. "'It is early yet,' said Lord Cheriton, looking at his watch, and from that to the neat little clock on the mantelpiece, where the hands pointed to twenty minutes past nine. "'The dog cart is waiting outside.' Do you drive to the Priory and put yourself on guard there till... till that unhappy woman has been traced? You can tell Juanita that I have sent you there, that I have heard of dangerous characters being about, and that I am afraid of her being in the house with only servants. My wife shall follow you later, and can stay at the Priory while I am away from home, which I must be, perhaps for some time. I have to find her, Theodore. Have you any idea where she may be gone? For the moment, none. She may have made her way to the nearest river and thrown herself in. Living or dead, I have to find her. That is my business. And when I have found her, I have to get her put away out of the reach of the law. That is my business. God help you carry it through, said Theodore. I shall stay at the Priory till I hear from you. Be so kind as to ask Lady Cheriton to bring my portmanteau and dressing bag in her carriage this afternoon. I may tell Juanita that her mother is coming today, may I not? Decidedly. Goodbye. God bless you, Theodore. I know that I may rely upon your holding your tongue. I know I can rely upon your active help if I should need you. And so, with a cordial grasp of hands, they parted, Theodore to take his seat in the dog cart and drive towards the priory to offer himself to his cousin as her guest for an indefinite period. It was a curious position in which he found himself, but the delight of being in Juanita's society, of being in some wise her protector, was a counterbalance to the embarrassing conditions under which he was to approach her. End of Chapter 12 Chapter 13 Love's Reasons Without Reason The cob was all the fresher for the impatience which he had suffered in standing for nearly an hour in the lane, and he bowled the dog-cart along the level roads at a tremendous pace. Theodore arrived at the priory before eleven, and found Juanita sitting on the lawn with her baby in her lap and her dog sticks at her side. His heart leapt with gladness at the sight of her sitting there, 
safe and happy in the morning sunshine, for his morbid imagination had been at work as he drove along, and he had been haunted by hideous visions of some swift and bloody act which might be done by the fugitive madwoman before he could reach the priory. What deed might not be done by a woman in the state of mind which that woman must have been in when she left the evidence and the confession of her crime upon a table and fled out of her house in the early morning? A silent thanksgiving went up from his heart to his God as he saw Juanita sitting in the sunshine, smiling at him, holding out her hand to him in surprised welcome. She was safe, and it was his business to guard her against that deadly enemy. He knew now whence the danger was to come, whose the hand he had to fear. It was no longer a nameless enemy, an inscrutable peril from which he had to defend her. How early you are, Theodore. Everybody is well, I hope. There is nothing wrong at home. No, everyone is well. Your father is going to London for a few days, and your mother is coming to stay with you during his absence, and I come to throw myself on your hospitality while she is here. His lordship has heard of some suspicious characters in your neighborhood, and has taken it into his head that it will be well for you to have me as your guest until your brothers-in-law come to you for the shooting. I hope you won't mind having me, Juanita. Mind? No. I am delighted to have you and my mother, too. I was beginning to feel rather lonely, and had half decided on carrying baby off to Swanage. Isn't he a fortunate boy to have two doting grandmothers? She checked herself with a sudden sigh, remembering in what respect the richly dowered infant was so much poorer than other babies. Yes, darling, she murmured, bending over the sleeping face, rosy amidst its lace and ribbons as it nestled against her arm. Yes, there is plenty of love for you upon earth, my fatherless one. And, who knows, perhaps his love is watching over you in heaven. After this maternal interlude, she remembered the obligations of hospitality. Have you breakfasted, Theodore? You must have left Cheriton very early. Theodore did not tell her how early, but he confessed to having taken only a cup of tea. Then I will order some breakfast out here for you. It is such a perfect morning. Baby and I will stay with you while you take your breakfast. She called the nurse who was close by and gave her orders, and presently the gypsy table was brought out and a cosy breakfast was arranged upon the shining damask, and Theodore was having his coffee poured out for him by the loveliest hand he had ever seen, while the nurse paraded up and down the lawn with the newly awakened baby. "'I cannot understand my father taking an alarm of that kind,' Juanita said presently after a thoughtful silence. "'It is so unlike him.' as if any harm could come to me from tramps or gypsies, or even professional burglars with half a dozen men servants in the house and all my jewels safe at the bank. Theodore, does it mean anything? she asked suddenly. Does it mean that my father has found out something about the murder? He was silent, painfully embarrassed by this home question. To answer it would be to break faith with Lord Cheriton. To refuse to answer it was in some manner to break his promise to Juanita. I must ask you to let me leave that question unanswered for a few days, he said. Whatever discovery has been made, it is your father's discovery and not mine. His lips alone can tell it to you. You know who murdered my husband? No, Juanita, I know nothing. The light we are following may be a false one. He remembered how many lying confessions of crime had been made by lunacy since the history of crime began. How poor distraught creatures, who would not have killed a worm, had taken upon themselves the burden of notorious assassinations, and had put the police to the trouble of proving them self-accusing perjurers. Might not Mrs. Porter be such an one as these? Ah, but you are following some new light. You are on the track of his murderer. I think we are, but you must be patient, Juanita. You must wait till your father may choose to speak. The business is out of my hands now and has passed into his. And he is going to London today, you say. He is going upon that business. I have said too much already, Juanita. I entreat you to ask me no more. She gave an impatient sigh and turned from her cousin to the dog, as if he were the more interesting companion of the two. Well, I suppose I must be content to wait, she said. But if you knew what I have suffered, what I shall suffer till that mystery is solved, you would not wonder if I feel angry at being kept in the dark. Has your friend gone back to London? Yes, but he is coming again before my holiday is over. You like him, I know, Juanita, he added, looking at her somewhat earnestly. Yes, I like him, she answered carelessly, but with a faint blush. I suppose most people like him, do they not? He is so bright and clever. I am very glad you like him. He is the most valued friend I have. Indeed, I might almost say he is the only friend I made for myself at the university. 
I made plenty of acquaintances, but very few I cared to meet in afterlife. Ramsay was like a brother. It would have been a real grief to me if our friendship had not lasted. He is ambitious, is he not? Very ambitious. And proud? Very proud. But it is a noble pride, the pride that keeps a man straight in all his doings, the pride that prefers bread and cheese in a garret to turtle and venison at a parvenu's table. He is a splendid fellow, Nita, and I am proud of his friendship. Is he very busy that he should be so determined to leave Dorchester? Yes, he is full of work always. I thought he might have been content to take two or three weeks quiet reading in our sleepy old town, but he wanted to get back to the hospital. He will come back for a day or two when the whim seizes him. He has always been erratic in his pleasures, but steady as a rock in his work. End of chapter 13